Okay. Good morning, everyone. For those of us that are morning people, I'm not, but <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I'm honored to be able to to talk to you this morning. Um, let me see about getting this in the present mode. There we go. You don't know if there's a. Is it just by the keyboard? I guess it is. I think okay. so for right, All right. now. Yes. Very good. Very good. Um, I like to talk about the class from which my presentations come from. Uh, I'm an alumnus of the MLS program at SMU here. Um, the context I think is important to talk about first. Just I'm going to give you maybe a minute of the class first. Um, this is Ethical Implications in Children's Literature. We looked at fairy tales first and foremost. Boy, what an eye-opener that was. Demeaning to women. That was a shock to me, and there were only six of us in the class, wonderful class. Six total students, myself and five women, and total shock to us as we looked at fairy tales. Short stories, novels, Charlotte's Web. I talked about Charlotte's Web last year at Rice. Uh, I absolutely loved analyzing that book. And then picture books was my favorite category. We analyzed 58 total picture books. I analyzed 28 as part of this um, presentation and paper, and we looked at 30 additional picture books. Um, to give you a picture of the, of the, the divorce picture, in America, first-time marriages, <coughs> it's a flip of the coin. It gets a little better as you go around the world. I was part of this statistic. Uh, I am a child of divorce. Um, I did manage to find the oldest picture book uh, about this subject was from 1977, right in that category. And uh, one and a half million children, 18 or younger, are affected by divorce. I tried to go and find somebody who had already done this, analyzed picture books that were specific to helping children of divorce. Couldn't find anything. But that was okay because I am the expert. I was a child of divorce. I was 11 when uh, my parents divorced. I was very cognizant of everything within earshot and eyeshot that was going on. So I, it didn't bother me not to find anything on that. But I did find some academic support in the, the area of bibliotherapy. The Early Childhood Education Journal had um, Smith and Kramer referred to this as book matching. Helps children get in touch with feelings of fear, guilt, or shame. Provides an avenue for the release of pent-up emotions. And then Wyman Moe actually talks specifically about picture books in this realm. The importance is because of divorces occurring in the first ten years of marriage. They're vulnerable to feelings of loss and rejection, and they have less cognitive control. And of the complexities of feelings, and they don't have the vocabulary to express themselves. This was my thesis. Now, in a class of only six students, there's a lot of latitude. This thesis didn't appear to the bottom of the third page of a 30-page expose on 16 books. I'm going to go through eight today. I whittled it down and dusted off this, and I realized I can do a better job. When you dust things off and look at them six years later, you can do a much better job, and I'm hoping to do that today. Uh, the issues during divorce. Top of the list for me is loss of confidence. That's what happened to me. I lost a lot of confidence as a child when my parents divorced. I got it back in a year or so, but for about a year, I wasn't the same person. I'm not going to read all of these. Just give you the picture. Lots of reasons for the need for picture books. Um, general observations that weren't multinational, mostly Caucasian middle class families. These books are about one sided custody, the mother, usually, a dual announcement to the child. There was some religious infusing, which I'll, I'll touch on briefly, and parent proximity. Very young audience, mostly. Not anything in the young adult area. And 
the storylines portray the relationship between the child and the parents, and some domestic issues are touched upon. Uh, the roles, mostly, or some wrote books portray the roles through animals, emotions through animals. You'll find glossaries, appendices, footnotes to adults, footnotes to children, and even some indexing in these books. Some self-illustration was in one book. I'm going to flip through these a little bit quick. Um, the, I want to get to a, as many uh, concepts as possible. This is bears, not surprising. Uh, portraying the roles through animals. Dresses guilty <laughs> fault. Storybook, guidebook, hybrid, a very young audience. We have footnotes to parents. This was unique because it offered the sale of a teddy bear for the child. I didn't see that anywhere else. Same technique here, just using foxes. Very young audience. This had footnotes to children, which was unique. And indexes are rare. Glossaries and clinical guides, very normal, but indexes were very rare. I didn't see that in any other book. Um, dinosaurs, not surprising, also. Uh, this was a comic book format. This shows the contents in a glossary in front. That was a nice feature. The comic book format. Even a mention of alcoholism here. The best in show in the animals books, I thought, was this book. This portrays a young girl's emotions through individual animals. This is a very powerful, accurate scene. It's when the parents announce the divorce. I related to that very well. Here we have seeking power to stop the fighting through the elephant, running away from the problem, seeking armor, anger, sadness or depression, and being scared or frustrated. And we have the title of the book here in very big, bold letters. Affirmation of parents' love and presence. The desire to escape the problem. Now this was a dual use here the bird because the parents affirmed here they would go find the child and bring the child back home. And then another affirmation of love from the bears. This was an appendices uh, from a PhD that was unique also. This was a special book for me because I got to trade emails with the author of this book. This is based on an actual incident. Her child is a, a child of divorce. She, the author, is not a child of divorce. I thought this was an amazing book to, to be so successful. It was published by the first publisher she sent this to. It is an addressing long-distance parent, which was unique. It addresses an African-American girl. That was unique. In my Broken promises. A picture book with themed color. That was not unique. And the father is never depicted here, unless you count just that little picture there on the card box. The blue was themed throughout. That was really nice. I theorized in the paper that it was akin to the musical blues genre. The book is bookended with the, the, the phrase, Good Night, Daddy. Here she speaks to her father through the stars and says, Good Night, Daddy, in hopes of seeing the father the next morning. She assumes she will. But he doesn't arrive, and you can see on, in this illustration, her face says what the conversation is. You don't have to hear anything. All you have to do is look at her face to know he's not showing up. Here we have self-assurance, <clears throat> more self-assurance. She realizes she has family, a very supportive family she can turn to. And the book closes with her saying goodnight, Daddy, and I theorized in the paper that this was her saying, I may see you, I don't know exactly when, but until I do, I'm fine. This was a unique book in that it showed text editing by the child as the, the story progressed. Here we see an example, the first example of text self-editing by the child. This creates ambiguity between the homes. She changes the location of where the father and the mother live to, because she wants one home, not two. The gray in the depictions 
also support the ambiguity. We don't know where the mother and father live. Not by this. You can't tell because she edited it the way she wanted to. And this continues until we finally see the editing to stop as she goes towards reconciliation. We do this with Daddy, we do this with Mommy. And again, here we see that. This closing spread was what I theorized in the paper as being an homage to Syndax, where the, where the wild things are, which is a very famous Caldecott winning book. And I'll, I'll run you through this really quick for those of you who don't know the story. Max is the character. He goes through a dream journey to address his problems depicted by these monstrous half-humans. And when he returns home from his dream journey to his bedroom, his dinner is still is waiting for him, and Sendak makes you turn the page after all these grand illustrations, and you see these five words, powerful five words. That's a whole other presentation. And that's what I theorized. Let me just run back here. That's what I theorized was happening here just not together. This book had some unique things. It's consoling a child through a stuffed animal. It has religious infusion, and it is a portrayal of premature aging. Here she says she doesn't like doing grown-up things, but she's okay. The infusion of religion here, I don't have a problem with that. The only problem that I found for me, and I theorized in the paper, was an ethical implication, possibly, is if this book is presented to three, four, five-year-olds, very young children, who don't understand the concept of God, right? Who is God? God could be a guy down the street. Great. Can God come and make my family whole again? That could be problematic. In the category of two of, I found several books where they were saying, we now have two of everything. I thought this was best of class. It has an unusual unwedding storyline, more mature audience, it's a British publication, a humorous approach to divorce, it empowers children, it offers escapism for children. Here we see Demetrius and Paula holding the knife like a bride and groom, cutting their parents' wedding cake in half. This is a spectacular spread. Why? Because out of 28 books that I analyzed, the typical story was my mom lives here, I live with my mom, dad lives across town, I see dad on Saturdays, turn the page, maybe we get to see the problems. Maybe not. This puts the problems in front of the child. The whole laundry list right here. It also depicts opulence, which I theorized was kind of a fairy tale approach. Laundry list plus opulence plus humorous approach, I theorized was a fairy tale escapism in the realm of looking at divorce for children. Okay, if this is used in conjunction with books that are more closely resemble a child's reality. Caricature like illustrative style was unique. We show the distance at the dinner table here. The ugliness of the parents illustrated. That is very real. Here we see some of the British humor. Concrete bath and the fireworks, and most importantly, the unamused children. Here they are seeking, oops, sorry, they are seeking problem, problem. They have problem parents and they're seeking um, help from their peers. The unwedding proposal by the children, again, the children are empowered here. And I theorized the cake was more of a dead cake. It's an ash funeral gray. The unwedding ceremony, because together they have misery. The opening spread, if we remember, was showing all the problems in this grand house. Well, children, their way of starting new is just to demolish the whole thing. I thought that was a great, great illustration. Here we see the two houses, two of, mom and dad, a passage from each, only wide enough for the children. Again, empowering the children, visitation controlled by the children. And the fairy tale genre with the castle is illustrated. 
They celebrate happily ever after apart. This was a special book for me because I liked the illustrative approach. It was really one big long poem, textual rhyming, that was unique, another British publication. It shows the child's world broken, which is a, a nice visual for young children. Guilt and fault are addressed. Isolation, denial, and supportive peers. Even the glue shop and the glue inside are broken. That's how broken a child's world can be. This was unique, a non-parent adult offering guidance and enlightenment. And here we see self-affirmation, restoration of confidence, affirmation of parental love, and then enlightenment and restoration of confidence as uh, he says goodbye to the adhesives and so much more. And of course the glue is not for the parents, the glue is for the child. The world now glued together, but I theorize this might be a little too easy for children, but the, the final sentence reminds us <coughs> there is no glue for heart, so that means we have work still to do, right? So, anything we want to talk about? I have the books here, by the way, if anybody wants to actually view me. Yes. I was wondering if in your research you found books with more than one child. I did, yes. I didn't feel like they were um, written well enough uh, or illustrated well enough to make the cut for the, the paper. The paper, actually, um, I profiled 16 books and I whittled those down to just these eight. But yes, there are some with multiple children. I was just wondering if that last book you said you thought was too easy for children. I just would, could you expand on that a little bit? Like, um, you... Well, sure. I, the reason I said that is because I, it might give the impression that a bottle of glue is all you need. Oh, okay. you know, and, and I was just thinking very literally, you mm -hmm. know, like, Mom, can you just go to the store and get some glue and just let's just get this taken care of? Yeah. But um, in the I think the parents, you know, that's up to the parents to make sure that that's not read that way. Yes? As a child of divorce yourself, which book resonated emotionally the most with you? This, this last one. This last one. Yeah, because the very last, what he gets to is a restoration of confidence, and it's very prominent in this book. That was really, really special for me personally. Yes, sir. What did you see with socioeconomic um, <coughs> status here? Because I've seen the opulence of the one family, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much middle class. Uh, do you see much with children of poverty that seem to have uh, greater, you know, uh, incidences of divorce? I, were there any that dealt with, you know, being in a financially struggling household and stuff like that, and uh, that those issues? That's a great point. I did not find that depicted in any of the books. Um, that would be a great subtopic to have added to my analysis. Yeah, the fact that I didn't find any. Um, I think the, the lack of just volume, um, I, I went out to Amazon and I literally ordered every book I could find on the subject, a picture book dealing with divorce, and I looked at 28 of them, and socioeconomic um, issues just were not depicted. You know, that, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't even realize that until you just said that. Yeah, that's a great point. Yes, you looked at books um, starting, you said the first one you started in the 1970s and then progressing to today. Um, did you notice a significant change over time? And any of the aspects you talked about, like the animals being portrayed instead of people, um, how it was handled in, this, in the picture books? Um, I, I found them to get more, uh, more sophisticated. Like going from 1977, this is a very basically, very basically written book and illustration, all the way to something as elaborate as these two. Yeah, there's a big difference. These 
are from the uh, about 15 years ago. And um, yeah, it was a huge leap from from this to having something that would really, really be really pleasing to the eye of the child and actually draw the child into the book. I didn't find that this drew the child into the book very well. Yes, if you were to walk into a Barnes and Noble today, would you find these books incorporated into the children's section, or do you have to go to like a niche area of the store to find books that have kind of you know the glossaries and like the notes from PhDs, or are they starting to be more like a kid could just select it from the options? That is a great point. I did not even think about that. I, I was, um, this class, we were kind of pressed for time. We got to the final project very late. So I, because of Amazon, I was able yeah. to, you know, in warped time, get all these books to me for really quickly. I didn't even think about going to Barnes & Noble. That's a great question. I, that would be really interesting. I think I might go to Barnes & Noble this afternoon, I'd literally, and, and do that. Yeah, that's a great question. You mentioned corresponding with one author who was yes. not a child of divorce. Did she say what her motivation was for spending all this time on this project? My apologies. I should have um, elaborated on that. Her daughter, if you remember, um, her daughter has a, a happy face on her shirt. Uh, her daughter was supposed to see her father when they were visiting a, a, a distance. They were taking a trip to another city. She was supposed to visit the father, the father canceled, and so that seed became the creative seed, the, the creative seed for the whole book. So, um, I, I, what I did was I took this book and uh, a couple of others into my capstone project six years later, and I was corresponding with her about her creative process. My capstone project was about the creative process behind things that are written for children. So that's when she told me the inside story, yeah. Let's get John here.